three, Jaron, if you will. That's how. That's where we are in this scenario. That I know some of you guys missed it because you were gone, but here's where we are. Matthew twenty four fifteen, and what I, what I want you to see here is that the Bible confirms itself, and it confirms exactly what's going on. And we've come to a place. Uh, are we on now? Yeah, we've come to a place where um, we have chosen to follow a stream that isn't really defensible anymore. It's becoming less and less defensible and uh, it, with regards to what's going on. And <clears throat> the basic question that I would ask that people are claiming that Christ could come at any time, um, that's good. He's God. He can come anytime he wants to come. Um, but it appears prophetically that he times these things out. We know that he did in the Old Testament up to the time of Jesus Christ to the day. To the day. That's why they welcomed him as he came into the into Jerusalem and they cried, Hosanna, Hosanna. He had been to Jerusalem several times. They didn't, they didn't greet him that way until he came in on that day that Daniel had prophesied that he would come in. And so, so as he returns, like it says in Amos, he's, he's not going to do anything without letting his prophets know. Those people, those Jewish people, knew that he was that he was the Messiah according to the timing, according to what he was doing. And when he walked into Jerusalem on that day and they cried, Hosanna, Hosanna, we call it Palm Sunday. Um, and then a couple days later, they're yelling, crucify him, crucify him. Because what happened is, as long as the teaching fit the pharisaical teaching at the time, that's when the Messiah was supposed to come, then that's what they taught. But then they didn't see him as a suffering savior. They saw him as a victor over Rome, that he was going to destroy Rome and take uh, take out Herod and all these phony uh, Jewish kind of converts. He was part, Herod was part Jewish and uh, mostly Greek. And, and so um, they, they thought he's going to come and destroy all these people. Then when he didn't do what they wanted him to do, what they had uh, forecasted, broadcasted, prophesied in their own words, not by the Bible, that they they thought that's what was going to happen and when it didn't then they turned the whole people on him and and ended up crucifying him and so you look at it today and we're looking not looking forward to but in the in the future there's going to be an antichrist that people are going to say oh this guy is the most wonderful thing that ever happened he's 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 a godly man he's the man that god has picked to and, and because we don't know the end times Many will fall away. Many will fall away. It says that in the Bible that, that many will go apostate because they don't know what's going on. And so we have to determine in our minds, are we going to learn the signs of his coming? Because it, it appears for all practical purposes that this is the time that he would return. I don't set dates, but there is a season and the seasons are beginning to unfold with the things we've seen happen in Israel, particularly, and the people come back and, the, and become a nation again and become a nation in one day, um, that's never happened before. Uh, for, for literally millions of people to re-coagulate, if I can use that term, they re-coagulated to their nation, Israel, that's never happened before. Nations came and went, and they came and went, and they came and went, but never has it ever been that it completely was gone and now it's it's a thing again, you know. It's it was gone. Israel was gone in the sense that it turned into to uh, Palestine and and was an Arab nation of sorts. And then boom, overnight it becomes uh, a nation, Israel again. And what's interesting is that young people, maybe some of the twenty-ish people, maybe even thirty-ish people, they have no clue about this. They don't know that Israel was never a country because it's been in the foreground of all the of all the news all the time. And then think about it, think about it for a minute. There's one nation on earth that's about the size of New Jersey, Delaware, small, right? It's the country of Israel, yet all the things in the world are focused on it. Everybody's against them, except for America. You know, all the Arab countries are against them. So many countries are against them. And why? They're just this little bitty country. And like I said last week, you know, there's there what was one fifth of one percent of the world population is Jewish, yet 22 percent of the Nobel Prize winners are all Jewish. There's see, there's something, there's something about God's people, and we as Christians are grafted into that vine. 
We're, we get to be grafted into that vine, and we should respect that opportunity to be part of that vine. And in that, we should be students of the word. We should want to find out what God, there should be a desire in our heart to find out what God wants to do and what's going on. And or we make a decision to coast. And or we say, well, this can't be the time. Um, we were just talking a few minutes ago about Pentecost and uh, people visiting other churches and that sort of thing. And they say there's so many churches out there that say this wasn't for today. This is all passed away. You know, God no longer heals people miraculously. God no longer uh, prophesies people mirac through people miraculously. God, yet the Bible said God's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And he says in Amos 3, 7, I won't do anything without talking to my prophets. Corinthians 14, 1 Corinthians 14, clearly says the order of how to speak you know, tongues are to be used in the, in the church and in your personal life, and it's laid out so specifically. But what has happened is man takes these things, and they say, well, you know, I'm not real comfortable with that, or I'm not real comfortable with this. And they don't want the Holy, they deny the Holy Spirit. They deny the Holy Spirit's working. And as a result of that, we've got a whole bunch of people in, in this world today that don't believe, that believe, they say they believe in Christ, but they don't believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I think to myself, what an insult that is to God. What an insult that is to the Holy Spirit to say, oh, I believe in Jesus and I'll take the benefits of his blood and I'll take the benefits of his salvation, but I, I, I don't want nothing to do with this Holy Ghost stuff. Don't, don't talk to me about it. And, and in some ways you can't blame them too much because some people have taken the whole Pentecostal thing and, and turned it into a sideshow. So um, it, it's, it's really, and it all goes back to, do I know the word? Do I know what the word says? And, and am I following the word to the best of my ability? Again, I say, I'm not, I'm not the guy that has all the answers. All I'm saying is that I study the word, I look at the word, I see other people, uh, like our friend here, and uh, I try not to mention names too much on the internet, but, and, and he's studying the word, and he was curious about the four winds, and he studies the word, and he comes out with exactly the same thing, without a, any conversation between us. Because you know what it is? It's both of us looking at the word independently, yet looking at it with, with the, the Greek and the Hebrew, looking at the logic of, you know, the four angels and the fifth angel, and it's, it's all there. And it's not, but see, we've, we've turned it into something else. And... Uh, we really have to we really have to watch that jesus very purposely told us what was going to happen when he returned he very specifically told us it's recorded in mark and luke and in uh matthew of what would happen and then when he met with uh <clears throat> when he when he met uh in heaven in revelation when he met with john in heaven in revelation he describes it in greater detail in the first 11 chapters. And then in the last 12 and onward chapters, he, uh, he explains it in even greater detail of what's going to happen. And people say, oh, it's so symbolic, I can't follow it, know it. And it's really not as symbolic as people want to make it. But it all depends on whether or not you really want to study the Word of God. So what I've done here and what we started to do in a couple weeks ago, and we've gone to some other paths on the way, what I did is I took Matthew, where Jesus spoke about what's going to happen, and I took Daniel and some of the other prophets, and I paralleled that and said, okay, do these things match up? And if they do, then what do they mean? But here, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Now, how could God be any more specific? How could God be any more specific? He says, you know what I want you to do? I'm not going to go into a deep explanation of what Daniel prophesied here or what Daniel saw in the Old Testament, but I'm going to tell you, go back and read it and you'll understand it. See, and if you don't do that, or if you do something differently and you say, well, I'm just going to decide this is what's happening, and I'm going, to, I'm going to focus on, then let those who are Judea flee the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field go back and get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. So I want to look at that. And I've already decided that the church is gone by this point. So who is he talking to? Oh, well, it says, let them, those who, those who are in Judea, flee to the mountains. So he's talking to Jews only. He's only talking to Israel. That, and that's what people want to say. And what they did is they didn't go back and look at Daniel. They didn't go back and study what Daniel said. If they did, they went searching for their hypothesis to be fulfilled rather than the truth. It's kind of like evolution. If we go and look for 
if we go and look for uh, traces of evolution and we say, I want to find uh, the missing link, for example. And so I go and I find, I go and find the, the Neanderthal man, which it, it, the initial ne ne Neanderthal man was a hoax. I don't know if you knew that or not, but the, the Neanderthal man that I learned about in school was a hoax. It was later on that they actually did find some Neanderthal man. I'm not going to go into that whole story of how it was a hoax, but it was a hoax by one scientist who thought that he would trick all the other scientists as a joke, as a sarcastic joke, but then it got out of hand and people actually believed it and they ran with it. And he actually had the head of, or, or the skull of, uh, of uh, somebody that had some kind of physical, mental uh, uh, issue in their life and he used that skull. Well, later they did actually find quote unquote Neanderthal men. But you know, if you want to study it from a biblical standpoint, you'd say, okay, the Bible says people live to be 900 years old. Uh, plus in, in, in those days. And something that you may or may not know, you might know by looking at me, but you may or may not know, as you grow older, your forehead begins to protrude more. Each, each year, your forehead becomes more and more distinct. Now, if I lived to be 900 years old, you might imagine how distinct my forehead would be? I'd look like a Neanderthal man. So you see, if I look at it from a biblical standpoint and say, okay, I want to reinforce, I want to use this skull to prove the point that people lived to be 900 and some years old prior to the flood. And so, and it just goes on and on and on. I love the not looking for the forest of the trees. You ever heard that, you know, not seeing the forest because of the trees? Well, there's a place in France, which is one of the most famous archeological finds where it's all layered. It's very specifically layered. And you can say, oh, wow, the fossils here or, you know, this million, you know, millions of years old, and the fossils here or this, you know, they're this million years old and the, pro the fossils here are like 900,000 years old. And I can go up this whole mountain and it's, it's been sheared off so you can just see it as plain as day. It's as plain as day. And you say, wow, isn't that something? They can go through there and they can look at each one of those different levels and they can see how time has progressed over the last millions and millions of years, right? Only if you stand back from that cliff, about 400, 500 feet back from that cliff, you'll see something interesting. You'll see the trees, the petrified wood of trees that grow through or went through all those different layers. And so I, I, I don't know, maybe you're not, maybe you're brighter than I am, but I, <clears throat> I do not know how you could have a tree, a petrified tree that was billions of years old, that the sediment went up and that tree never fell. That tree never rotted. That tree never was diseased for millions and millions of years. And then finally, finally it was standing that whole time. And I'm not talking about just one tree. I'm talking about you stand back and there's a forest of trees that go through all those different layers. And it's like, gosh, you know, how could that be? Unless it was a chasm of cataclysmic flood that layered all those things in a short period of time over maybe 100 days or 120, 200 days. And it layered, layered all that back down on top of those trees and those trees didn't have a chance to fall. See, but, but see, being a, a person that's already decided that, that the, old, the earth is old, it's millions of years old, and we evolved here, then I go and I look at a Neanderthal man and I say, oh, look, we used to look like that not giving any credit to the fact that I'm a scientist and I know that as people age, their forehead protrudes and eventually a man would look like that if he lived to be 900 years old. And then I, I look at the, the trees in that and I said, well, I can't look at the trees. I have to go and look at the different layers and say, wow, here's this kind of, here's this kind of uh, shell. There's this kind of, you know, fish. There's this kind of, and I can go up the different layers and never saying once to myself, oh gosh, now, now I use that example and you, you hear that example and you say, wow, well, I see what you're talking about, but I want you to take that another step and I want you to say, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer, and rather than discovering what the Word actually says and standing back and saying, can I see the forest through the trees? And can I see the development of, of human beings? Can I see that? Can I step back far enough and say, I don't want somebody else's conclusion. I want somebody else's hypothesis. I can use those to, uh, to help me clarify what I come up with in the Word. But I want to look at the Word and say, what does it say? And so here we have, 
we have somebody is being told, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And I'm going to use that statement to say that, that this is about Israel and the church is already raptured. That's, um, that's not realistic because all these things are happening right now. And those same evangelical people that deny, that deny these end time signs that will come, they get all excited when the end time signs come. Are you tracking with me here? In other words, if I don't need any end time signs to be to prove that Jesus is coming back soon, I just conclude Jesus is coming back soon because he's coming back soon because he can come anytime he wants, right? So I'm just going to conclude that. But then why would I get excited about the signs? Because I'm not supposed to be looking for any signs. I'm not supposed to be waiting for any signs. None of that's supposed to happen, right? And you're driving along in the car, and I hate to use simplistic examples, but you're driving along in the car, kids in the back seat, and what do they say? What do kids regularly say? What did I say when I was a kid? And sitting in the back, we used to travel in a 51 Chevy. There was four kids. My dad put plywood on the floor where your feet went, and, and the three kids would sleep down there, and I slept back in the window, you know, you know where there's, and it was, it was a fastback, so there was enough room that I could actually sleep above the seat in the back window. No seat belts, nothing like that. There weren't any seat belts in the car. And we're rolling down the highway, and what do kids say? Are we there yet, Dad? And what does Dad say? We'll get there when we get there. Or we'll be there in a couple hours. It was never relative to us. But I knew that when we were going to Colorado and I could look out that front window from my viewpoint back there because I could see over all everybody else's heads, I could look through the... And when I saw the mountains of Colorado going from Nebraska to Colorado, when I could see the mountains in Denver, I knew we were getting close to being there. And I'll tell you right now, I see the mountains in Denver with regards to Scripture. I think we're almost there. But, but see, if I say to my dad, are we there yet? He would say, we'll get there when we get there. Just, just settle down. We'll get there when we get there. Knowing that it took hours and hours to get there on the old brick road. It was a brick road, Highway 30, 31, whatever it was. There was no interstates. Eisenhower hadn't been president yet. And, and we didn't have the interstates. And we're going down a two-lane brick road. <clears throat> and the car would about blow off the highway when the big semis went by. Of course, the semis weren't nearly as big as they are today. But um, it, was, uh, it was interesting. Are we there yet? And so the church says, you know, are we there yet? And if somebody says, a pastor says, we'll get there when we get there. Jesus will come whenever he wants to come. Then you're not tracking scripture because scripture says, I want you to know. Scripture says, watch. Why would he bother telling us to watch if he had no intention of us watching? Why would he give us all these parables about things that would happen in the last days? Why would he tell us about these kinds of things? Therefore, when you see an abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. And then you go to Daniel 12, and from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,000. 335 days. And I explained why there's two different timings there. I explained it because of the, the different calendars that we use, um, the Jewish calendar, uh, a lunar calendar, and our calendar, which is, a, which is a solar calendar. And their lunar calendar, instead of having uh, a leap year each four years, they had, <clears throat> they had uh, a whole month, a leap month, if you want to t call it, every seventh year. So um, this, this is kind of interesting because what he's telling us is this thing's going to go on seven years. See, if you don't know the two difference, he says, Blessed be the one shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and comes to 1,335 days. That's seven years. Because the, the extra month comes only once every seven years. And so we can do the math. But you say... Why doesn't why don't people know this? Why don't people they don't want to they don't want to calculate it They don't want to go in this in depth because you know what it takes it takes time and it takes study It takes cross-reference. It takes a real heart to know God and that's how and I go back to it all the time That's how Simeon and Anna knew who Jesus was at his birth because they knew the spirit well enough that 
Anna could say, my savior is finally here and became the first woman evangelist. In fact, the first evangelist period, she went around telling everybody that the Messiah had come. And Simeon says, I can die now. I'm an old man. I've seen my savior and God promised me I'd see my savior. I can die now. They knew him. It would have birth. Yet, yet the Pharisees didn't recognize him when he walked the earth and did all the, the prophecies, fulfilled all the prophecies that he was said to, to fulfill because people don't really want to know. And you have to decide, am I one who really wants to know? Do I really want to know my Jesus? Do I really want to know what, what he's saying to me? And I think of the, 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 the woman, and, and please don't call me chauvinistic, but I think of the woman in World War II that her husband's over fighting and she waits kind of on edge every month and, and she maybe is working in a war factory or a bomb factory or a plane factory and she waits every month or every few weeks to get that letter from her husband and she pours over every word that he says and he on the other hand is waiting for that letter to come from his wife for that for that mail call to come and he gets that way and he goes over every word and he probably keeps it and reads it over and over and over and she keeps it in a shoebox up in the attic and into the 50th and 60th year of their marriage <clears throat> because of how precious it is. And Jesus said in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is the Word. This is Jesus speaking. This is his love letter to the church. This is so we know that we're aware of what's going on. But keep going on. Let's, let's not stay too long on that. Matthew 24, 20, and pray that with your flight not be in winter or on the Sabbath, for then there will be great tribulation such as not been since the beginning of the world <clears throat> until this time. No, no, ever shall be. No, nor ever shall be. Unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the eldest elect's sake, the days will be shortened. Daniel 12, 1. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, every one who is found written in the book. So there you go. <clears throat> both Jesus and both Jesus and Daniel say, we're going to be taken out. But when are we going to be taken out? The verse before we just read about the dissolution, uh, the abomination of dissolution. We saw that happen. And then now it says, and pray that your flight not be in winter. So he's continuing the thought. And he said, and there'll be great tribulations that's never been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. Now, what you'd have to do is say, where does that tribulation start? Where does the Bible say that tribulation starts? Well, in Revelation, it says the, the tribulation starts in the second, at the beginning of the second half of the second part of the three and a half years. And, and it's, it's a little hard to track because of the different calendars, so it could be a week or two into it. But the Great Tribulation, there is no mention of a Great Tribulation like this tribulation until you're three and a half years in. So what I have to do is I have to say, well, the church is gone and this is, this is, uh, this is Israel, right? But then, then I'm confused because it says, even at that time, at the time of your people, I'm back in Daniel, time your people shall be delivered, everyone who's found written in the book. Who's written in the book? We're written in the book. We're written in the book. Messianic Jews are written in the book, but a, a Jew who is not in relationship with God, has not accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they're not written in the book. So how could this be anybody but Christians? Because we're written in the book. Unless those days were shortened, no flesh should be saved. For the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonder to deceive if possible, even the elect. See, I've told you beforehand. See, Jesus is saying, I'm telling you beforehand. There's going to be people that are going to deceive you. There's going to be people that are be misleading you. And he says, I'm telling you this beforehand. And, and Amos 3.7 says, surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. So if he reveals his secrets to the prophets, if I believe his word, if I believe what the Bible says, and I believe Amos 3, 7, that God does nothing except for what he reveals to his, to his saints or his, prophets, his servants and prophets, then, then I'm reading here that, look, I have told you beforehand. I've explained this to you. Okay, if he's explained it to me and I'm gone, what's the point of him explaining it to me? What would I be looking forward to? What am I looking for? 
Why are we excited that Israel's a nation again? Why are we excited that in 1967, 50 years later, in the, the Six Day War, they, they, they took Jerusalem back? Why are we excited that the, the seating president right now, uh, Donald Trump, recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel? Why are we excited about those prophecies being fulfilled if we're already gone? What, what's the point of us being excited? You know, I don't know if I'm making sense to you, but why would I be excited about things that don't have to happen before, before he returns? Why would I get excited about that? It's, it's neutral. And you're saying, Pastor, I don't understand. It, it, it's, you would be neutral about those things. You wouldn't be excited about them. It's because it means nothing. We'll get there when we get there. Go up a little bit higher. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, do not go out. Or look in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so will the becoming the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcasses there will be eagles will be gathered together. How can it be any clearer? When Jesus comes, it's not going to be some secret thing that happens in the middle of the night, as we saw in, in some of the movies you know, that we've watched when we first got saved 30 years ago. It, you know, it, it's, it says here in the Bible, I mean, how could I have made a movie about a secret return of Jesus Christ, a secret rapture, a secret taking away of the saints? How could I write that and, and say, the Bible says, for as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man be. Now you say, wait a minute, does, does lightning flash from the east to the west? Yes, it does. Go to Colorado Springs. I've got a, actually, I've got a video of it that we were going to put on America's Funniest Video. We never did. We're sitting in our van and we're so enamored by this lightning storm. It was about 4.30 in the afternoon. Uh, we're on a mountain near uh, Cheyenne Mountain. We're on a road near Cheyenne Mountain. And we're looking out across. We pull into a high school parking lot. There was no school. It was summertime. And there was lightning flashes coming just like crazy. And we said, whoa, is this cool? And so my son had uh, one of those JVC, Panasonic, or whatever they are, camcorders. And he's camcording. He's recording it. We have the tape. He's recording these lightning flashes. And they're coming down like this. And then all of a sudden, it goes kaboom. And I'm holding on to the steering wheel of my van. At that time, it was a little conversion van. And I, my hands fly off. I can't hold on. It wasn't that I was trying to hold on. I was just sitting there watching the lightning, holding on the steering wheel. And then, bam, my hands come off the steering wheel. And my son falls back across the, the hump, whatever they call it, the doghouse. He falls back over the doghouse on top of me. And I said, what in the world just happened? And so we took the tape. We took the tape. We thought, we just got hit by lightning. But how could that be? Because it's over there by the mountains and it's coming down straight. So we go back to my sister's house and we play the, we play the VCR, we play the, the tape, we play it real slowly. I assume he still has it, I don't know, but we play it back real slowly. And you know what? It wasn't that lightning. We specifically saw a flash of lightning go from the east to the west. It went straight across the top of that high school and, hit, and we were close enough to it that we didn't get killed but there was enough uh, radiant electricity in the air from the lightning that, that it shook our whole vehicle and shocked me and shocked him. And we still got the video. I'm pretty sure he still got the video. And, um, and you know what? It didn't go from the west to the east. It went from the east to the west. And how would the Bible know? How would Jesus say, for as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so shall be coming a man? How could that be? See how we miss these important things, these cool things. And I'm, I, sometimes I feel like I'm Forrest Gump because I was there when things happened. You know, how many people have been hit by lightning and saw it go and have it on video going from east to west? Cool, huh? Well, I've got it. It wasn't the one Jesus was coming back for. But when I got to this scripture, I said, oh, my gosh, I've seen this. Been there, done that. Keep going. Immediately after the tribulation those days, oh wait, go back just down a little bit. I want to just spend a second. It says, for wherever the carcass is, there, is, there the eagles will be gathered together. The, the carcass is there, the eagles will be gathered together. 
there is going to be a whole bunch of unsaved people on this earth and they'll be the carcasses and we'll see that when we get further into the Bible, we get to Gog and Magog and the Battle of Magog and Magog. We'll see, we'll see more of that and we'll, we'll explain that more. But keep going. Matthew 24, 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will get... Well, wait a minute. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. I thought the tribulation started three and a half years earlier. No, that's not true. We can't assume the seven years of the last week of Daniel's 70th week. We can't, we can't assume that all seven years is a tribulation because it never says that. We've assumed that and we've made movies about that. and We've said that the church will be taken up before that because great tribulation will come. Then no, great tribulation comes three and a half years after the people began to worship and call the Antichrist the Messiah. And immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be dark and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. See, what's going to happen there is everything that's happened up to that point is, is mankind. Everything that's happened up to that point has been either caused by the enemy, uh, Satan, operating from... Uh, principalities and powers in, in high places, in heavenly places, as, as Paul describes to us in Ephesians. He's operating up there, and he's manipulating people, and it's our sin that is causing the earth to do what it's doing. It's our sin, the earth, it says in Romans, that the, that the, that the earth cries out, the earth groans under the pressures of sin. And you say, well, how can sin? Because God created us in dominion over the earth. He gave mankind dominion over the earth, and, and we've just kind of ignored that. We gave it to Satan. We gave it to Satan in the garden. And since then, he's ruled over us. He's ruled over man. And Christians, because they don't understand who they are, where they're seated in heavenly places next to Christ Jesus. I love that, too, because it says Jesus was seated at the right hand of the Father. So it says we're seated in heavenly places next to him. What, what side are we on? What side are we on? We're not next to God, so we're not on the left-hand side. Jesus, we're not between God and Jesus, so we're not on his left-hand side. Where are we? We're at the right-hand side of Jesus. We're his right-hand guy here on earth. And, and honestly, we have let him down. We have played church. We have, we have focused on ourselves. We have turned church into us instead of evangelizing the world and seeing that my Savior, my Jesus, my God, my Creator says that His heart is that none should perish. And He's given us that, that opportunity to share our faith. He's given us that opportunity. And what have we done? We've cowered from it. We've cowered from it. America used to be bold missionaries throughout the whole world. Now we cower. We cower away from the courts. We cower away from politically correct things. We cower away from possibly losing our, our income or our livelihood. We cower we as Christians cower and you say, well, pastor, what can I do? Well, you can start by studying his word. You can start by trying to hear his voice and his direction for your life and then operating in that direction. Or, or you'll, you'll, you'll have another life wasted. Immediately after the tribulation of the days, the sun will be darkened. You see what's happening? This isn't, this isn't Satan anymore. This isn't man this isn't the sin of man causing these things. You know, I kind of love this. I haven't done a lot of research on this. I've just started researching it, and I was telling them about it in the car on the way down here. I've just begun my research on it. The whole idea that the, whole idea that, that the earth isn't, the climate change isn't happening because of our smog and our fog and our use of gasoline. Possibly indirectly, but not directly. Because you know what the global warming is coming from? The global warming is coming from inside the earth. As, as the earth is slightly expanding, the, the, the calderas, like Yellowstone, and another caldera you may not be familiar with, is the, did you know there's a great caldera under the Gulf of Mexico? Think of the circle. You see how Florida is on this side? Mexico comes up on this side. There's another great caldera in the Gulf of Mexico. And you know what's happening? And, and you were just at Yellowstone, right? What's happening 
there's actually parts of Yellowstone that get closed down occasionally because the waters in the lakes get too warm. And there'll be a sign that says you can't go here and, and that road will be blocked because the lakes are increasingly getting warmer. They aren't getting warmer because I drive my car too much. They aren't getting warmer because I use coal in my electric car instead of gas in my, in my gasoline car. And I don't have an electric car, but obviously one of the example I'm making, either one is using resources. <coughs> it's, the earth is getting warmer in the center. And what's happening is just what the Bible says. There's going to be volcanoes, and then there's going to be the volcano. And all kinds of, excuse me, hell is going to break loose if you want to think of it that way. If you think, the hell, you think of hell as the center of the earth, all hell is going to break loose. And we're going to see things that we've never seen before. And it's happening now. But see, we don't want to track that. We don't want to make it the public aware that, that we have teams of scientists in Yellowstone studying why why the water is getting warmer and warmer. They feel like the, the uh, molten the molten lava or whatever you call it in a caldera, because a caldera is different than a volcano. But as it's moving closer and closer to the surface, as it moves closer and closer to the surface, then all the waters get hotter, the earth gets hotter, and something's going to happen. And they say the last time it blew was 3,500 years ago, and the cycle is, is 2,500 years when it's supposed to blow. And it won't blow like a tip of a volcano. It'll be, it'll be quite different, but it'll, it'll change everything. But God predicts this in the Bible. God predicts this in the Bible. And we want to blame it on our, on, on our gas-powered vehicles and our, our heated homes, our natural gas heated homes. And there could be, and you remember, I'm a scientist, I'm an engineer. Have you ever driven by those areas where where they have transformers. Remember, you're probably not old enough to remember. They used to have a transformer on the pole at, by, your, by your house, and they get struck by lightning and your power would go off, right? And now you see these big transformer stations where there's like a whole area fenced off and it's all white rock and it's got all these transformers right there. Did you ever notice that they all have these like vertical kind of vent looking things, which obviously are coolants? And what coolant is running through there? So you may not know. What coolant is running through those transformers? Or you may know, if you're kind of an engineering science kind of a person, you know that the transformers, we used to bring electricity five, 600 volts to a neighborhood. But that's impractical because it overheats. And you lose a lot of energy when you lose heat. But if you send it at a higher voltage, like 13,560 volts, then you lose less in the transmission, you lose less electricity in the transmission. But then you have to have these big transformer stations, right? And you have these big transformer stations. I drive by one on 168th and Pacific all the time, these big transformer stations. And you know what they have in all those little vented, those fluted things? They have oil. Now I want you to think about this for a minute. We use oil to cool those transformers so that when we, when we convert from 13,000 volts down to 220 volts for our neighborhood, when we're converting that downward, we don't want to lose too much electricity to heat. They lose a certain amount of electricity to heat. All you got to do is know that electricity is being lost when you drive by those big power lines and your radio doesn't work because there's electricity being lost. And they want to stop that from happening. So when they convert it, they cool it with what? Oil. Now, what if the earth is cooled by oil and we continually extract all the oil out of the earth and there's nothing any longer to cool that magma because we're changing it because we're extracting all the oil that's used as a coolant by God to keep the magma. Is that pretty wild? So maybe we are. Maybe we are part of the problem. Maybe our use of gasoline and all that is part of the problem. But God predicted it was going to happen. And I don't think we're going to stop it. Other people will say, <coughs> it's not us at all. But it's the fact that there's some hidden planet X or something that's circling out there. And it's actually changing uh, the gravitational force on Earth, changing the magnetism on the Earth. And the Earth is actually swelling. And you can measure, it's interesting, on PBS the other day they were talking about the San Andreas Fault. And there's a place in Northern California 
I think it's just below, right near Oregon, Northern California. I can't remember the name of the island, but there's, a, there's an island there and my son's been there. He's wanted me to go hiking with him there. I haven't gone there with him yet. But it is moving a half an inch away from, a half an inch further away from the shore. In other words, there's this island and then there's this like river down between the island and the, and the land. And it's creeping away at about a half inch at a time. Now they say it's because of the plates that are moving. But the funny thing is, the plates there are like this. And it might be backwards to you guys. Maybe I should do it like this, but the plates are like this. This is the ocean side, this is the earth side, and the plate is doing this. So how does that get further away? How is that getting further away about a half inch every year that's getting wider and further away? They're measuring it on a regular basis. And this isn't weird off the web kind of stuff. This is PBS stuff. Maybe you can't trust that either, but, but anyhow, this is Nova stuff. And it, it's moving away, yet the plate is going that way. I'm confused. Shouldn't it be getting closer? Unless the earth is beginning to swell like they're saying that it is because the magma in the center is getting warmer and warmer and we don't know sure how, why. I, I'm sure somebody does. I'm sure some scientists or group of scientists somewhere know why and they're just not telling us. Because maybe they know the timing of this because when it happens, it says that <coughs> when he appears, the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man come in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. This is something God does. This isn't, this isn't man doing this. This is something that God does. It says, the, the days the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, the powers of heaven will be shaken, and the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. There will, all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. I don't want to mourn when he comes. I want to, I want to yippee ki yo ki you know? So what, what's going on? But look, I'll tell you what's going on. Watch. I go to Revelation 6.12. Then I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake. <coughs> and the sun became a sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it's shaken by the wind. And I won't even get into his parable on the fig tree and all that and what's going on. And, but anyhow, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as figs drops late figs when it's shaken by the mighty wind. Late, late figs, when do late figs fall? You see? And when is, the, when is the, the, the Feast of Trumpets? It's in the fall. We're in the summer. We're in the summer right now, in the sense that, of course, we're in the summer because it's August. But we're in the summer of between the 69th week and the 70th week of Daniel. We're in, this, we're in the summertime. We're in that time where things are growing, where the harvest is going to be great, and the great harvest is going to happen in the fall. Then the sky receded as a scroll, and went rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, and great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave, every free man, hid himself in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for to the great day of his wrath. Keep moving it up. The great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? I want you to see that. I want you to see what's going on there. They go and hide. And he said, oops, did you go too far? Yeah. The sky receded, a scroll and rolled up every mountain and island was moved out of its place and the kings of the earth and the great men, rich men. You know, I can never figure out why these guys went to the caves and hid. If everything is falling apart, why in the world would you go to the cave that hid and ask the mountains and the rocks to protect you? Unless... Unless the rocks and mountains are something different than you think of. Go, go into uh, really any kind of church, Catholic, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist. And what, what are the people worshiping there? Oh, they tell you they're not worshiping that. What are they worshiping there? <laughs> they're, they're, made, they're worshiping things made out of rocks. You know, the statue of the saints. I mean, I can't speak to the Hindus and the Buddhists so much, but I know they have all kinds of things, jade and all different kinds of things that they form and that they worship, right? You know what? Their God is the earth and the rocks and the things that are therein. 
That's their God. That's hard for us to conceptualize because we're Christians. And our God is an unseen God that's in relationship with us and the presence of His Holy Spirit is felt within us. And the power of His Holy Spirit is demonstrated in the power that He gives to us in His name, Jesus Christ. But the power of those people is in their rocks and their mountains. And you say, oh, come on, Pastor. Okay, why do we build skyscrapers hundreds and hundreds of stories tall? And when, when we build one that's taller than all the rest, the Japanese go and they build one taller than ours. And the Chinese go and build one taller than the... Than, why? What, what's the point? Is there not enough land on earth to build? No, we're, we're still building the temple at, at Babel. We're still building the temple of Babel. We're, we see power in these huge, magnificent structures that we built. There are gods. Interesting. Fall, us and hide, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand. They know it's coming. They know it's coming. They deny it. You know, they call us deniers. They're denying it. They're denying the truth that Jesus Christ is going to return. And when he returns, all hell is going to break loose. But this is more than, this is more than earthly things. This is stuff that's going to be happening out in the universe way beyond anything we did you guys know did you know that just recently I think it was 2014 that the first time since Jesus Christ um, uh, was was born that the star of Bethlehem happened again on the same exact uh, day of feast that that he was that he was born this is the first time in 2,000 years when the star of Bethlehem showed up at the same exact feast again is that pretty wild you know if you guys you know things are happening Things are happening, and, and I know people take all these rabbit trails and they try and prove with this star being here and that star being there and all that. And that's all fine. That's nice. That's interesting. But let's look at the Word, and what does the Word say? Keep going. And He will send His angels with a great sound of trumpets and they will gather together His elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. Like the four winds thing, right? Yeah. Different four winds, but yeah. He'll gather together. Oh, wait a minute. How did he gather us together if he gathered us together three and a half, four years before that? What's he gathering us together here for? What's going on? I, I'm confused because he gathered us together three and a half years ago. See, it, it all began, this, this is going to sound silly, but it all began when I began to think about the marriage supper of the Lamb. The marriage supper of the Lamb. If the Jews get raptured at a second point, if the Jews get raptured at a second point, they miss the marriage supper because the pre-trib people want to tell you that the marriage supper of the Lamb is going on during that first three and a half years when the earth is kind of, the Antichrist is kind of falling apart here and Jesus took us out and we're going to go and have the, we're going to go and have the marriage supper of the Lamb. So what about all those other people? They don't get to be part of the bride? They, they, they're part of the bride later? but they didn't get to go to the wedding ceremony? I mean, just think about it. If we don't all go together, if all of his elect doesn't go together, he goes through the trouble of taking them out of their graves first and then bringing us together with him in the air? Think about it. What do you do with the Johnny-come-latelys if they get raptured later and the marriage supper of the Lamb already happened? I, I just think about these things. Think about these things and say, how can this work? Oh, they're part of the bride too. They just weren't at the they just weren't at the wedding festival. That's strange. Daniel says, at that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never been since there was a nation, even to that time, and that time your people shall be delivered, everyone who's found written in the book. And I know I read that earlier, but I want to compare that to Matthew 24, 31. He gathers us together, and he's, he's specifically quoting Daniel, in a sense, saying that they're all gathered together at this time. 
And when is this time? This time is approximately is approximately when Michael fights the battle in heaven and Satan is thrown down to the earth. See, Satan was thrown out of heaven and he's been ruling in, in the heavenly places above us. That's why, that's why Paul said we don't battle against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers and higher. We're battling against a spirit realm. And if we're down here battling up, we're in trouble. Anybody that's been in the service here, and I know I've said this weeks before, but anybody that's been in the service here, if you're at the bottom of the hill and your enemy's at the top of the hill, who's at an advantage? But if the church is actually seated in heavenly places next to Jesus Christ and have the authority of his name, and we can go boldly before the throne of God, if we're in that place, where are we in comparison to where Satan is? We're above him. That's where God wants us to be. But by and large, most of the church is living in a carnal world. And I don't mean the carnal world. I meant carnal world. They're living in carnal world. And they're fighting Satan from down here up. A, a great percentage of them because they don't have the power of the Holy Spirit and don't believe in it. Mm, don't want to hear it. You know, like the monkeys, you know, can't see, don't, you know, don't hear, don't speak. That's for another time. That's not for now. I'm not supposed to be battling the enemy. You know, we're, a war we're warriors. We're, arm we're the army of God. When will we wake up? You know, in, in the, and I don't want to go into it too far, but because I'm probably out of time already, getting close. And I do want to read this one quote before I get, get done. But um, how about the, the marriage supper when the king says, my son's getting married and I want to call in all the people. And the guy says, oh, I don't have time because I just bought some land. Oh, I don't have time to do this. I don't have time to do that. Why are they? They're carnal. And he says, he says, go out and call in anybody on the street. Go out and call in everybody on the street and see if you can't get them to come. Anybody that wants to come. You know what? If the church isn't going to be God's warriors and weaponry here on earth, if we're not going to fight the fight, he's going to go find somebody else. Because his heart is that none should perish, but all come to the glory, all come to repentance and to the relationship with God. That's his heart, and he wants that to be our heart too. Let me keep going. Now learn this parable from the fig tree, and, and I'm going to skip this. I'll come back to this uh, probably next week, but let's skip up because I got some good stuff I want to show you with regards to Thessalonians and, and, and the different parables that Jesus is going through. But keep going up a little bit further. See this part over here? Okay, Matthew 24, 36. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Okay, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But can you imagine this? You got to picture this for a second. Jesus is sitting next to the Father. We're sitting next to Jesus, right? He said, I don't do anything except for what I let my prophets know, right? The servants, my prophets know. We're sitting there, and Jesus is, hey, hey, Dad, when's, when's this going to happen? Shut up, son. I'm not going to tell you when it's happening. It, it, it's just not even, this is something he said to us while we're here on the earth. And you know why he said it to us? Because it was not going to be as clear as it was on that day of Palm Sunday. It's not going to be that clear where we know to the minute, to the day, when he's supposed to come back. He says, nobody, nobody knows that. And at that point, only his Father in heaven knew that because he hadn't ascended into heaven yet. But now he's seated at the right hand of God, and he knows when it's going to happen. And, and he's going to tell us. He wants us to be aware. He wants us to watch. But he's not going to tell us so specifically because he wants us to watch because our heart is towards him. Love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your mind, and all your strength. See, he wants us to be in love with him and discover what's going to happen because he gives it to us in his scriptures. And then he says... But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of man be. For as in the days of Noah, the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying, giving in marriage until the day of Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man be, which is interesting. He says it'll be like the day of Noah. Go back and read. I, I challenge you to go back and read. When did Noah get in the boat? When did Noah get in the boat? 
Whoa, the rain started, flood started. Hurry up, hurry up, honey, get in the boat. Oh, you guys get in the boat. Who's going to shut the door? Oh, God will shut the door. You go and study and find out when he went in the boat. He knew when to get in the boat. Everything all around him was going on as normal, in a sense. Consider the, the Nephilim and all the intermarriage of <coughs> angels and no pure blood for, this, for the Messiah to come from. The DNA is all destroyed except for Noah and his family. <coughs> so it's going to be that way. But this is what I want you to read. Can we know the timing? And this is a direct quote from David Reagan, Dr. David R. Reagan from Lamb and Lion Ministries. A very specifically imminent coming pre-trib ministry in the past. And look what he says. Quote, well, I want to talk about this for a moment. Is there anything we can know about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ? Can we know, for example, when Jesus is going to return? If you'd asked me that question 30 years ago, I would have said, no, absolutely not. There's not one thing you could ever know about the second coming of Jesus Christ. But after over 25 years of intensive study in Bible prophecy, of Bible prophecy, I've come to a different conclusion. When people ask me now, can we know when Jesus will return? My answer is yes and no. No, we cannot know the date. Yes, we can know the season. Do I have more of his quote? Jaron, you want to keep going up? I don't know if I have more of that. No, I don't. Okay, then I go to 1 Thessalonians and how it says we'll know the seasons. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1. But concerning the times of the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write you, for you yourselves know perfectly that day of the Lord. So come as a thief in the night. But I, when I say peace and say, and then he talks about it, and we'll go to this next week. But I wanted you to see that. Here's a great man of God, Dr. Reagan, heading a, a, a very successful prophet, pro, profitable ministry or profitable not necessarily in the sense of finances it's a good ministry and he says for 30 years I would have said no there's no way that we can know when he's coming back there's no sign that will show me that he's coming back but he said after 25 years of intensive study I can say that we don't know the day or the hour but we know the season and praise God for that. And praise God for that man that he was honest enough to make that statement. But I have a question. After 25 years of Bible study, did he ever read 1 Thessalonians 5.1? Because it says, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write you. For you yourselves know perfectly, 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 that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. And then he goes on to say, But to us it's not a thief, because we know. Should I read that? we got to go. But let me read that. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon the pregnant woman, then they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not, dark, not in darkness, so that the day should... that the day should uh, overtake you as a thief. You are all the sons of light and the sons of day. We are not of the night or the darkness. Now, how could that be any clearer? Praise God that man found it. And praise God that man had the courage to admit it. Thank you, Dr. Reagan. But you know yourselves perfectly that day as the Lord comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, and then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the sons of light and the sons of day. We are not, we are not of the night nor of the darkness. But sadly, I'll say, sadly, I'll say that there's a whole lot of Christians that are in the dark. And they've chosen to be in the dark. Either their leadership has led them to be in the dark, or they have chosen not to study the Word of God and get out of the dark. It says, fear the Lord your God. Fear the Lord your God. You know that word means reverence, not scaredy cat. Give reverence to the Lord your God. He's the king of the universe. And the way we give him reverence is we study his word and we know what's going to happen because he's revealed it to us, his saints, his servants, his prophets. 
And Jesus says this, and not just Jesus, Isaiah 13, 6. Well, for the day of the Lord is at hand, it will come as destruction from the Almighty. Therefore, all hands will be limp, every man's heart will melt, and there will be afraid. Pangs and sorrow will take over him, take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman in childbirth. You, you know, look at the, you think Paul made that up? No, because Jesus said it. 24-7, for nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes, but all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Jesus said it, Isaiah said it, Paul said it. How do we miss it? We miss it because 30 years ago, I was taught that this could not happen like that. And it was 25 years later that I saw it. And I can make the same confession that Dr. Reagan has made. 30 years ago, I was taught when I was born again that it was going to come as a thief in the night. I saw the movie. Bought the tickets, saw the movie, bought the video. It wasn't DVDs in those days. I got the video. It come like a thief in the night. Surprise, surprise. Remember, uh, what was his name? Uh, Oh, Gomer Pyle. Yeah, yeah, Gomer Pyle. Surprise, surprise, surprise. Well, it ain't no surprise to us if we're children of light and not of the darkness. But how can that be? How can that be? Light. Light. And where does the light come? When Jesus came, it says in John chapter 1, that he was the life, and the life was the light unto men. We got the light, and it's whether we choose to search for the light or ignore the light. I always like the, 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 <laughs> the, the ship is going along, and there's a storm, and he's flashing at this other guy. He sees a light ahead of him, and he sees the other guy and he flashes the light to him and he says, uh, you need to move because there's a certain size you're supposed to be on and that, you know, starboard, all that stuff, I don't know. But you're supposed to be on a certain side and the, the light wouldn't move to the other side. And they kept flashing at it, you need to move to the other side. And he said, and then finally the captain got on the flasher thing and he says, I'm the, or the admiral or whatever he was of the ship, the captain of the ship. And he signals, I am the captain of the SS whatever and I command you to move to the other side because it was a bad storm and he's supposed to move to the other side. He was on the wrong side. And the guy with the light flashes back. He says, I'm the lighthouse. <laughs> and I'm not moving and you better move. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes the lighthouse is shining on us, Jesus Christ. And we've been signaling God, you better change how things are going to work because this is how we think it should work. And he says, well, you think whatever you want to think, but this is how it's going to work. And it's in the Word of God. Father, we praise you. We thank you. We give you the glory. This is exciting stuff. It's an exciting day that we live in. Why we get to be here at this time, I have no clue. It may be, it may be a scary thing when they start cutting our heads off. But right now, Father God, it's an exciting time to be alive. Help us, O oh Lord. Help us, help us, help us to share our faith. Help us to have the heart of God dwelling within inside of us, your Holy Spirit dwells inside us, that none should perish, that none should perish, but everyone should come to repentance and come into relationship with Jesus Christ. Father, make us evangelists. Make us evangelists. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Exciting times that we live in.